Friends, welcome to the first of three lectures in the Princeton Lectures on Youth, Church, and Culture. These lectures launched in 1995 with the idea that youth ministry and deep theological reflection belong to one another. I would like to introduce our first lecturer for this event. You will meet one each day. Our first lecturer is Dr. Georgette Legister. You heard a little bit about Georgette or Jojo in the spotlight that we just had. She is a research associate and visiting instructor at Harvard Divinity School. She is also the vice president of diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Universal Music Group, UMG. Her role at UMG includes leading global workplace initiatives that cultivate a culture of belonging through education, celebration, and execution of strategies that foster an environment in which all teammates belong and flourish. At UMG, she recently joined the DIBS, which is Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and People, Inclusion, and Culture, PIC, teams, after serving as the executive director and lead facilitator at Fearless Dialogues. And this might be where you know um, Georgette from. If you came to the forum in 2017, then you met Georgette um, through her work with Fearless Dialogues. Fearless Dialogues is an Atlanta-based organization that prioritizes innovation and transformation in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and leadership development. A Congolese American who is fluent in four languages, Dr. Legister specializes in training leaders to courageously embrace the constructive possibilities of conflict and difference. She holds a PhD in social ethics from Emory University and has been a visiting lecturer at Harvard, Emory, Agnes Scott College, and Earlham College. Now, when I first met Dr. Legister, we had both just had babies in 2017. And we shared those knowing glances with each other about how incredibly wild a season that first year of life and full-time work is. Um, we shared those glances at this event, at the, at the forum. Her Zuri, hi Zuri, you're with us today, turned five recently, right? Okay, and my Solve turns six this week. We call those forum babies <laughs> here at the Institute for Youth Ministry. <laughs> And um, I remember at that event in 2017, really just stopping into one of the classrooms and watching in a span of six minutes, humans who had never before met were suddenly transgressing the boundaries of classroom space and actually being vulnerable with one another, connecting, sharing honestly, beautifully encountering each other. I knew in that moment that we would have to have Dr. Legister back with us. Today's lecture is entitled, A Lesson from Mother, an African Indigenous Approach to Diversity, Community, and Conflict. We will hold space for questions at the end. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Georgette Legister. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I am not accustomed to having conversation and learning from behind a podium. Um, but having done these um, kinds of events and teaching on Zoom, I feel honored that we are not separated by miles and distance. And for those of you who are online, um, this, this kind of engagement online is familiar to me. For those of you in this space, we'll try to figure it out. Please act like this podium is not a barrier or obstruction, but perhaps something that can enable our friends online to also feel like they're in this space with us. Thank you for showing up. Uh, we're going to have some fun today. I hope that you will speak to me and with one another as much as um, I will speak so that I'm not the sole voice in the space because you all are the experts doing the work that is so desperately needed. All right, when you came in, um, I had a very, very strange request to the um, IYM team and they rose to the challenge as they always do. I requested um, that they prepare a bowl of ice and some cups. Um, the cups will play a very functional, utilitarian role. These cups are my insurance policy to ensure that I get invited back again. So whatever we're going to do with the ice, please be sure to catch the drippings and the liquid in the cup, lest I never be invited to come back, no matter how many children I bring with me to the <laughs> forum. <floor. laughs> All right, so if you have your ice, you know, let's just shake it in the cup like you had a cocktail or a mocktail. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. Wonderful. If you don't have ice, there is a bowl of ice. Uh, please do grab some. What I would like for you to do, um, as you are able, uh, to grab a piece of ice in the palm of your hand. And for our friends um, who are streaming in live, you get to observe and watch us struggle a bit. So attempt as best you can to close your hand around the ice as tightly as you are able. Please do not injure yourself. You cannot sue PTS. You cannot sue IYM. You cannot sue me, OK? <laughs> Um, so mind yourself. So let's just attempt, it's about been 30 seconds. Yep, as much as you can. You see the drip on mine? All right, about 45 seconds. If you need to drop the ice, please drop it. <laughs> How many of you still have your ice in your hand? I see some people doing deep belly breathing. Okay, <laughs> it's not that serious, but that's fine. Okay, I'm going to drop mine because it's getting too cold, so I'm tapping out. If you need to tap out, remember, you cannot sue me. If you need to tap out, please tap out. How many still have your ice in your hand? Let's see. What? Okay, let's all drop our ice. <laughs> Y'all didn't come to play. All right, so just tell me, what are the sensations that you feel in your hand? What are the sensations? Numbness, yes. Tingles, Tingles burn. Who said burn? Yes, burn. Wet, <laughs> yeah. Freezing. Freezing, yes. Others. Coldness, okay, what else? Pain, who said pain? Say more, tell me your name and say more. Uh, my name is Uzumba Belgium. I felt pain because my shoulders mm -hmm. and my hand we're connected to my heart. Listen, Sorry. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're <laughs> preaching. Um, you said your name is, is, is Izuma? Izuma. Izuma. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I felt pain because my shoulders and my hands were connected to my heart. Mm -hmm. So the pain went from my hands to me. So Listen, Izuma felt pain because the, shoulder, the hand is connected to the shoulder, which is connected to the heart. So when the pain, when the hand felt pain, the heart felt pain. You have literally summed up my entire 45 minute lecture in your response. You can all go home now. Wonderful. You have the rest of the afternoon free. No, no but the point is, all of these sensations are real. They're true. I love, love, love. Um, beginning to center ourselves in the body. This work that we do, it's called a lecture, which um, seduces us to keep the learning up here, um, in our minds, in our heads, to keep it cognitive. But what's more important, what we have learned over the last couple years, what we know to be true in working with young people is that the learning cannot remain cognitive. It must be affective, it must be embodied, we must be like August and discover everything through every sense beyond just sight and hearing. So what we've done is we've put the learning back in our bodies. When I was getting ready to give birth to Zuri, I know Zuri's going to get sick of this at some point. She doesn't realize that she's literally my sermon illust illustration. She is my teaching metaphor. She is my pedagogical assistant in everything that I do. Um, but I was getting ready to go into labor. And Zuri was my first child that I was getting to go into labor with. And my um, OB at the time, uh, Dr. B, identified as a male and was preparing me. And I was like, sir, have you ever actually delivered a baby out of your body? And he looked at me like, that is such an unnecessary question. I'm like, answer the question. And he was like, yeah, no. And I was like, yeah, but you don't have anything to teach me. He's like, that's fine. I don't have to teach you anything. But let's engage in a learning experiment together. I was not an easy pregnant lady, y'all. I was, mm, mm And so he challenged me. He said, what is your tolerance for pain? I said, I am a black woman living in America. My tolerance for pain is high, OK? I was born on the continent of Africa. What do you mean? And he's like, sis, it's not that serious. He was black. It's not that serious. He said, I need you to practice to expand your tolerance for pain over time. So grab some ice every night, you know, you and Andre, and time how long you can hold ice in your hands. It never fails. I drop mine at around 
60, 70 seconds. Um, it's been the same, Zuri's five. So for the last five years, I have been unable to hold an ice cube in my palm for more than about a minute. Now, I'm a social ethicist. I know that nothing is impossible, but I have yet to hear of labor that lasts 60 to 70 seconds. <laughs> right? And so needless to say, <laughs> I was unable, I, I did not uh, progress. The, the lesson was not learned in the way that my doctor hoped. And I also ended up having a C-section anyway, so it was moot. However, the point is that lesson stayed with me. Learning how to develop, cultivate in our body, our ability to live with pain a little bit longer. Now this was an exercise for all of us, but for people who identify as being different, who show up every day holding the proverbial ice cube, they can't drop that ice cube. That's what it feels like. This discomfort that we feel, you know, in talking about um, issues of conflict and diversity and inclusion. What is that anyway? That discomfort that you feel, you know, in your mind, we put it in our bodies with the ice cube, but this is literally some people's lived realities. I cannot pass. I can only ever show up as a black female identifying woman in all the spaces where I am and all the discomforts of that brains the code switching that I must engage in, the shrinking, the need to lead with my title to get a modicum of respect. That ice cube stays in my hand. Now think about young people. We have so, <laughs> millennials talk so much trash about Gen Z, okay? And Gen X talks trash about millennials. And the boomers thinks everybody needs to shut up. <laughs> to be young, to be young, which is a shared experience of the people that we work with, is to hold literally an ice cube block and now layer all of the multiple identities that our young people are showing up in. And they cannot drop that ice cube. There is so much legislation going on right now, pending in too many states, to violate the rights of trans identifying young people. And before so many of us say, well, I don't have any trans people in my community, are you sure? Maybe you're not safe enough to know that they're trans identifying young people in your community, the ice cubes, y'all. So anytime you feel a sense of discomfort, do I have enough? Am I enough? Can I have this conversation? This person's identity makes me uncomfortable. Remember this exercise with the ice cube. Don't remember me not making it to, you know, that portion of labor, but remember what it must perhaps just a little bit feel like to be someone who identifies as being from a community of difference. So that's how we're, we're breaking the ice. Um, if we weren't in COVID times, we probably need to hug each other right about now. But just imagine that, you know, I'm hugging you all. Hugs. Um, any questions, comments about this exercise? What's going through your minds? I'm getting a lot of nods and thoughtful, hmm, a deep sigh, a deep belly sigh over here. Uh, what's going through your mind? Yeah. I mean, like, lead out with title versus self. Yes. And it's difficult. It's, I don't feel like crying today. It's weird. Listen, I'll cry with you. I'm always on the brink, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell me your name. Margaret Conley. Margaret, thank you. Others, what are your thoughts? What are you thinking? What's going through your mind? Yes, please. Well, I was just thinking about the exercise and how it didn't bother me to hold the ice in my hand for long. Mm. And wondering what that means yeah. about my tolerance for pain. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me your name. We were table mates earlier. Yes, we were. Tamisha. 
Tanisha. Tanisha. Was Tanisha. Thank you. And thanks for welcoming me and being my table mate earlier. Um, I got goosebumps when you said what you said, and I still have them. You know, um, what does it mean to hold the ice cube for so long that you don't feel anything? Because that's the other end of the spectrum. That's also a place of embodied existence, too. And how do we, can we even ask? For your hand to feel again? Is it ethical for us to ask for your hand to feel again? Is it safer for your hand to not feel anymore? What do we do with that? How do we unpack that? Yeah. Others, let me take a couple more thoughts. Yes, please. Um, striped gray shirt and then right in front of you, che checkered mask. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Shirt. Tell me your name. <laughs> you see, trying to be sassy. Tell me your name. That's fair. Aaron. Aaron, thank you. Yeah, so it struck me that some people held on to the ice because they needed permission to like let go of the ice. Mm. And it made me think about the ways in which people hold on to pain and you know mm -hmm. never communicate that they are in a state of pain because yeah. they feel like they haven't been told yet to let go of the ice. That's right. Aaron, that is profound. Permission. What role does permission play? How many young people are waiting for your permission to show up and to let go? How many? And you know, we are, it's hitting us, right? We're moved and we're struck by it. But this is also how we teach people to show up and adult, right? All of these rules, spoken and unspoken, written and unwritten, this is what adulting looks like. And what we're also telling young people is, in order to not fit this mold of adulting, you have to ask me for permission. Who gave us that right? Mm, Aaron, you're messing people up. Thank you. Yes, and in front of Aaron with the checkered mask, please tell me your name. Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Um, I was just thinking about the, the longer I was holding the ice, the more the ice was changing. Yes. As it melted. Yes. But never went away. Yes. And so it started, I could feel it getting cold in new areas. Yes. On my hand. And I just thought that uh, at some point that it might either completely numb or um, become non-existent, and that just never happened. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, side note, SN, colon. If any of you decide to write a blog piece or an article or a book based on this metaphor and do not cite me, I will find you. <laughs> I will make sure your publisher knows that you plagiarized me. But really, what you said was remarkable, right? The longer you held on to the ice cube, Brian, the more it changed. Pain is not static. And we've understood that life is not static, right? We're living in the realities of the precarity of life. But somehow, when it comes to understanding the pain of others, and especially young people, we have a really static definition of pain. Oh, you're not struggling? When I was your age. And listen, y'all, I know I look like one of your youth. I know I do, I know I do. Nod, please. I know I look like one of your youth. But uh, I am a proud member of the millennial generation. Yes, come on, millennials. Are we in here? Yeah. We're not young anymore. Let me tell you what my... <laughs> Let me tell you what my daughter said to me. She came up to me one day, she said, she wanted to whisper in my ear, mommy, she doesn't know how to whisper, mommy. I said, yes, baby. She's like, I wanna tell you something. I said, yes. She's like, you're going to get old. I said, now what kind of secret is that? Thank you, Captain Obvious. But it was a reminder, I am no longer in the young category. And I have caught myself saying those things that our elders say. Oh, just live on a little bit longer. What does that mean? 
Pain is not static. Experience is not static. The longer you hold on to something, it changes. So do we change with it? I give you all cups. Now, if I really didn't want to be invited back, if we wanted to really follow through the multiple ways this metaphor plays out, I wouldn't have given you cups. I would have let you get wet. You know how I feel about rain and pee. We talked about that earlier. Um, but <laughs> do not quote me on that. Um, but there's something to be said, right? I helped you at least. I had the decency to help you to be prepared for the change that would happen. Um, what tools do we give young people to prepare for the change? How do we catch their pain when it shifts and changes in front of us? We could do this. This could be my single slide, and we could do, do this for the next 37 minutes and be done. But there's actually more that I want to share. But I want to thank you for helping um, all of us to learn. We are in the learning community. So to all of you who shared your comments, I am grateful. Uh, feel free to do this exercise with your young people. Anything that you see here, try it. Um, test it out um, and let's all be more inclusive and change in a more healthy way okay so um, we talked about two lessons two lessons from mother um, the first lesson is from mother Africa I am because we are um, this has been the statement that has universally captured our moral imagination since the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, God rest his soul. I should have put a picture in there. You know how people um, like to like name drop? But you know, with this generation, it's not just name dropping, you have to photo drop. I should have photo dropped. I was about my daughter's age on Archbishop Tutu's lap, like, mm, I know, I know. <laughs> But Archbishop Tutu did not coin I am because we are. Ubuntu is an entire moral philosophical system. Um, it has been reduced to kumbaya songs at campfires and unity. We're all the same, U-N-I-T-Y, you know? And the way that Ubuntu is typically approached, it makes people feel like I cannot be different if I'm going to be a part of Ubuntu. But that is far from what Ubuntu is. Ubuntu is hard. The reason why Tutu was um, alluding to Ubuntu during the commission hearings, these hearings where perpetrators were required to testify of the atrocities that they committed in front of survivors, because they had to own their part in breaking community in order to remain in community. So let's talk a little bit about what it means, I am because we are. What does that mean to you when you hear that, I am because we are? Yes, please. Hierarchy is nonsense. Mm. Mm. Tell me your name. Denise. Denise? Yeah, hierarchy, hierarchy is nonsense. Yeah. Powerful. Someone else. I am because we are. Yes, please. I just think um, that I wouldn't be anything like the person I am today without my family and all the other people who were around me for the past years of my life. Absolutely. Tell me your name. Becca. Becca. Becca would not be the person that Becca is without family and the people that made Becca who Becca is. Correct? Yeah. That's lovely. You got a couple more. I ignore the growling, baby. <laughs> <laughs> to my right. <laughs> yeah. Let me get a couple more. Yes, please. We have a, we have a saying in our church uh, that's similar in it. It says that for in their welfare resides my welfare. For in their welfare resides my welfare. I love that. Tell me your name. Eli. Eli. If you all don't have a cool saying in your church, uh, you can uh, talk to Eli about adopting what Eli's church is using. That's lovely. Let me get one more person. I am because we, yes. I see it as sort of developmental. Everyone, okay. whether I know them now or not, everyone I've crossed paths with, throughout my entire life 
has made me who I am. Yes. Good lessons, hard lessons. Yes. Um, that's and these amazing people who were part of my cohort. Absolutely. Tell me your name. Maureen. Maureen. Everyone that you have crossed in your in crossed paths with in your lifetime has made you who you are. Absolutely. Um, you all have been very kind and too polite to also venture on the opposite side of this meaning, right? That also means, so I, I live, currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. It's yet! Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you don't know, now you know. It's an entire mood and vibe, 24-7. Okay. Um, I live in Atlanta. And, you know, after Outcasts, people stop looking at Atlanta like as a culture builder, right? As of cultural national consequence until the elections. Uh-huh. Y'all know. 2020. All of a sudden, the whole nation was looking at Atlanta and Georgia again as a place of cultural, national, historical consequence. So you know, the Democrats won. That's senatorial race. Um, but everyone was, their minds were boggled. Wait, we thought it would be a landslide. What about the other half of the country? And then I started hearing a whole lot of, well, you know, I voted on the right side. I'm not a part of the 49%. I'm a part of the 51%. I come from a country that has only had three sets of actual elections since our independence in 1960. Some of you in this room, I'm not going to be rude. Some of you know people who are not in this room who are older than the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah? Three sets of elections. My mind cannot comprehend how elections and a yard sign can divide relatives. Because to have elections, to me, is privilege enough. Right? But you know, we're not going to talk about that today. <laughs> I am because we are. So that 49%, you are because that 49% is. And in fact, if we truly believe that I am because we are, there is no 51% or 49%. Y'all disagree. I don't care. That's rude. Um, but the fact of the matter is, we cannot other an attempt to model and support and empower the next generation to not do what we're doing right now. Forget what was done before us. I am because we are. So maybe if, if me, and the 49% are indistinguishable from one another, then maybe it doesn't matter what kind of ballot I cast. Maybe the issue is not at the poll. The issue is that hand, the pain in the hand traveling up the shoulder and into the heart. So if that's been, you know, your soft pillow to sleep on, at least I didn't vote in the 49%. Well, yeah. I have bad news for us today, or good news. We're, we're all in the 49%. And we're also all in the 51%. OK, moving on. Uh, so this lesson from Mother Africa about Ubuntu, it's all about identity, how we choose to show up. Um, in my work in DEI, you know, one of the gifts in diversity, equity, and inclusion work is helping people to understand that this is not new. 
People don't like it when I say that. Because um, it's a very kind of sexy industry right now, right? DEI. Do you have a DEI minister? Are your people DEI trained? Um, if you are wondering how to weave that in, if your young people are asking you about it, you know, those are legitimate questions, but DEI work has existed in other forms before. We've just gotten new, more constructive language for it. If you are working with people, you've been doing DEI work, well or badly, <laughs> all along, right? But now we're learning the tools to make it more discernible. So this is about identity, how people choose to show up and what people choose to share and what permissions we need to take down for people to show up. So what are the implications of I am because we are for you, for us as individuals? What does that mean for us? If we truly, truly believe I am because we are, for us as we relate to our young people, are you schooling them? I love what um, Reverend Dr. Ligonde said earlier. Are you saying, what would you like to talk about? Or are you sending somebody else to do the hard work? Because that's a black youth, and you know, we can't really relate. So let me find the hip, cool black person in the church to have the conversation with the black youth. What does that, how does that land with you? What are the implications for you? Let me hear from some of you. I am because we are. Yes, please. We want the black person to do the work with the black, and I'm not willing to do the work. Absolutely, tell me your name. Thomas. Thomas, yep. Because I mean, in the name of cultural relevance, I somehow limit your ability to understand me because our identities are different. I'm here to say that our identities are plural. And if the divine is of any consequence in your life and mine, that is commonality enough. And the burden of wading into unknown waters should be on us, not on them. So don't punish them to not have a connection with you because they identify as non-binary and you don't know which pronoun to use. Work. You learned my name, Dr. Legister. You can learn a pronoun. Mm, OK. Uh, what are the implications of the above statement for your community? How does your community engage this? Or not? I am because we are. Is it relevant? Aside from Eli, it's Eli, right? Aside from Eli's church done got it. So you know, check, you're good. But for the rest of us, is this a reality in our communities? I am because we are. No, okay, we just move on. Don't tell on your church, let's just move on. <laughs> so let's go to the church universal. Let's not, let's leave the local church alone. Uh, what are the implications of the above statement for the church? I am um, a member of the Methodist Church. We are going through a schism that we hope that people would ignore because of a global pandemic. We were like, oh, yes. <laughs> Let's slide on by. But now it's back to haunt us. And we're back in the news, OK? What are the implication of this statement for the church? Church universal. You can talk about somebody else's church and tradition. Yes. I think two and three at this time, they, they really are. I don't know how to answer that. I know personally, because two and three are looking the same, community and church universal. Um, and the world is watching that in westernized thought. Right? It's looking the same, yeah. uh, not to pick on uh, the Methodist church. No, um, go ahead. The, <laughs> the, the, you know, the global space yeah. uh, split because it disagreed with global issues. So it doesn't make sense. But I mean, to me, but I'm just saying, I'm, but I'm good in Baptist and we always trying to find a Oh, way it's to coming for y'all too. Don't oh, worry. Well, no, we, are, we done got it and had it and we done had so many, you know, reformations. Um, we'll have another one. <laughs> it's coming. It's Baptist coming. in a minute. Yes. Um, so we, we get it. But at yep. the end, you know, how do we, I, I, don't, I don't 
don't know if church community and church universal actually want to function as I am because we are. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we want to do that because then that would literally, what you said at lunch today was huge. Like it would erase the hierarchy. Um, and I like wearing my red get up that it doesn't make sense because it belongs to the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and I'm a bishop of Baptist. I mean, I don't know why I would want to lose that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's a question that, you know, I'm not any of what I just said, but I'm just saying, that's a that's an issue that also as a therapist I know tags mental health because it sits on my couch every week. So absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Yes. When I was looking at this, I agree with the community and church kind of blurring right now. But I'm thinking about I am because we are. I am a Christian because we are, and I don't know if I like to tell people that right now. Come on, tell the truth. I'm a follower of Christ, but I don't know that I am a Christian because we are. Mm. 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 And what are we? Who are we? Ooh, heavy questions. I have zero answers for those questions. <laughs> yes, tell me your name. Vicky. Vicky, thank you. Yep. I'll take one more. Yes. This is actually um, a conversation I've been having um, with a congregation that I've been working with. And um, the pastor and I have been trying to navigate this. She's the first black woman um, to pastor an all-white congregation. Mm. And they, they hired her because of kind of a sentiment like this. Mm -hmm. but, but there have been obstacles. Yep as she brings her full self into the space. Yep. And I, for me, I saw it firsthand in regards to selective solidarity. Mm -hmm. I think a few months ago, I preached there, and I had mentioned the treatment of Haitians at the border, I'm Haitian. Mm -hmm. And immediately after, was chastised for saying that I, you, know, you need to preach the facts from the pulpit. I didn't even mention anything except praying for the Haitians at the border. Mm -hmm. The same individual is trying to champion um, in this season some solidarity work around Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, you know, just this week, a pastor and I have been trying to navigate how do you pastor a community that believes I am because we are, but they don't see me as a we in that are. Tell me your name. Carmel. Carmel, absolutely. They don't see me as the we in the are. Ukraine is a beautiful example of Ubuntu at work, right? Um, because, let's just, you know, focus on the United States, the response, not just the military, political, financial response, the emotional response to Ukraine really is classic Ubuntu done well. We felt it. The we who are a part of the R felt Ukraine like it was happening right here. But the question is identity, who gets to be in that we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Second lesson was a lesson from my mother, Shimba Ndala Mulunda. And uh, <laughs> I'm saying this very cheekily because I want you all to remember her name um, in the same breath as I talk about urinating <laughs> in public. We're very close. <laughs> no, we are, for real, for real. Um, but when you are caught in the rain, the Luba proverb goes, Go ahead and urinate on yourself. This is an invitation to innovate in, mit in the midst of inconvenience. Some of us might not mind a little sprinkle of rain or even getting wet, especially bikers. I just, I wonder at bikers. I feel like you all have a closer seat to, you know, the sacred creator, um, you know, because just being wet doesn't seem to bother bikers. And I feel so much pity. I look at bikers when I'm driving like, oh, do you want me to pull over for you? And the biker's like, no, do you want to join me on the bike? No, I do not. Um, but drenched in a downpour where everything that you need to stay dry, nothing is dry, right? That kind of being caught in the rain. And what the Luba believe is, is instead of fighting it, 
instead of being angry at the fact that you are drenched, instead of being angry at the fact that the next bathroom is too far away, well, go ahead and go. Nobody will tell anyway. You were already wet. I love what one of the speakers said earlier. Um, I think it was, ooh, y'all. Having children's gotten rid of my name brain. Um, but our speaker, our scholar on neurodiversity and youth. Aaron, Dr. Rafferty, yes. Dr. Rafferty said, maybe we need to reconsider our rush to going back to the way that things were. You cannot, once you're drenched in the rain, there's nothing you can do but keep moving with it until you can get dry. There's no undoing it. You are drenched. There are things that need to get done. The resources, the limited resources that your ministry or your church or your community had before the pandemic became even more limited during the pandemic. Yes, we all got those wonderful PPP loans and a lot of them have been forgiven. Your budget lines looked really sweet in 2020 and 2021 and now it's back to 2022, no more PPPs coming through. We gotta move forward. Resources are limited, time is limited, goodwill is limited. People are frustrated and tired. Young people are looking for you to show up, hey sis, to show up and to make good on what youth ministry is going to be. Just go ahead and pee. You've been holding a lot. This one's not for the young people, this one's for us. Just pee, right? Do Zoom one more week. Ask the young people, what do you want to talk about? If they want to talk about nothing, I love what Dr. Ligonde did. They just ate. Is that sacred enough? Is that deep enough? Is that meaningful enough? Is that innovative enough? Yep. Who said so? You, and that's enough. Just pee. So. This is a question of dealing with inconvenience. How do you deal with inconvenience? And I'm saying, your young people, I hope you know your young people are not an inconvenience, right? I shouldn't have to say this, but maybe we should just say it and leave it alone. Oftentimes, we treat these people as inconveniences, inconvenient measures for our effectiveness in serving the church. Some of us didn't opt in to working with youth. Don't, don't identify yourself. <laughs> Some of us were convinced or voluntold or pressured or guilted into doing it. Or some of us are in youth ministry while waiting to get to do real ministry. We're gonna leave that alone. So how do you deal with inconvenience? Let's talk. How do you deal with inconvenience, personally? Yes, put yourself out there just a little bit. I told y'all about having a baby, so. <laughs> How do you deal with inconvenience? Yes, please. Um, the first thing that pops into my head is that a lot of people in the church that are on committees think, oh, well, if this needs to be cleaned, the youth should do it. Mm. Or <laughs> if this needs to be researched, the youth should do it. It, it just, so I feel like, part of my role has become saying no. Yeah. And it feels like they're treating the youth like an income. They're, they're covering up an inconvenience, just throwing teenagers at it. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me your name. April. April, absolutely. Okay, let's do a thought exercise, right? Um, somebody give me an example, you know. So April talked about something needing to be cleaned, right? Something needs to be cleaned, let the youth do it. What's something else that we like to throw at young people? Their budget is lower. Say it. The budget, the budget is lower because they don't contribute. So the but they don't contribute. Right. Yeah. So we're gonna give them less money. Yes. <laughs> Something else. Yes. I think yes, at least in my context, I think sometimes the kids get used as a way to bring in the people, the adults who do have money. Mm. When we get more kids in the youth group, though, their parents will come and they'll get more money. Yeah. Let's target them so that they can bring their money-winning parents. Yes. Wonderful. It doesn't actually work. Right. <laughs> so let's use those three examples. Let's swap youth for another community of difference. Uh, um. Let's use black people since I'm black. <laughs> Something needs to be clean. Have the black people do it. 
they don't contribute that much money, so let's give you know, ministries that are urban the least amount in the budget. They don't have money, but maybe they're connected to other people with money, so let's do some kind of you know, fundraising drive and see if we can get them and they can bring more donors to the church. Let's do another community of difference. Yes. I have neglected it here. We are looking at undocumented youths. Ah, wonderful. Let's talk about the undocumented. Something needs to be clean. Let's get the undocumented people in our community to do it. We're going to stop right there because this is getting to be really painful. But this might be a conversation to have. Next time you're sitting in a meeting and they want to get you to get young people to do it, say, hey, you know what? Let, let's, put, let's put the elderly in there. Think about the communities of difference that matter to your church, right? Let's, let's, let's put, um, you know, uh, our disabled members of our community in that sentence. And that discomfort, right? Be like, yeah. So if we're not comfortable doing that to those communities, why would we do this to our young people? Knowing that identities are multiple and plural. So, you know, at, at your next meeting, you're welcome. You can do this exercise with them. So you don't have to fight. Just have them think through it. Let's think through what you're asking these people to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that touched on number two a little bit, how our communities deal with inconvenience. Let's go to number three. How does the church universal deal with inconvenience? <laughs> yes, please. Say, say that again. Ooh, tell me your name. Mendocony. Mendocony, small performative acts. Mendocony is coming for the church mm. universal. <laughs> Small. It's not even like a big showy act anymore. I think back in the day, there used to be more energy. Let, let's pretend to really be here for this thing. But no, let's just have, you know, let's have South Asian Sunday. And then have the South Asian kids, you know, dance. Do a dance for us. Don't they have Christians there? Okay, nice. I think we also fight to be the first to write about it. Hmm. I remember when the, the, the war on Ukraine ha started, there was something in staff meeting like, oh, well, the, the Unitarian Church already put out how can we donate, and the Presbyterians haven't gotten there yet. Mm. I think like we're like the first to show that we are doing something or write about it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so, it's so fascinating that you say that. So I live in two very interesting spaces that um, each space pretends that the other doesn't exist, right? So academia and corporate America. Um, academia likes to really position corporate America as a place where Lucifer became Satan. <laughs> and uh, corporate America really likes to look at academia as a place where, you know, the smart people who want to do nothing go and hide. And I'm like, hey, I'm offended. I'm in both worlds. There's some merit, you know, to some of the stereotype. But it's fascinating because as soon as something happens, right? Let's talk about the murder of George Floyd. All the corporate statements that went out. Yeah, you all know. We won't rehearse them, right? And some of these companies were like, oh, that's not anything. How dare you? How many of us actually looked inward at our churches? Because we're also making statements. We're rushing to keep our congregations. We're rushing to attract the folks who cut the big checks. Doesn't look much different than Twitter or Apple or Facebook making the same kinds of statements to retain their consumers. Our consumers are people who come to our churches, y'all. So anytime you see you know, a, a critique against a company, put church in there and see how much of it resonates. And then if it bothers you, then stop and keep moving, bless you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Small performative acts, rushing to make statements, yes. I hope y'all can't hear this Alvin and the Chipmunks in the microphone. <laughs> okay, uh, so our time is running out. We're, we're doing Q&A in about nine minutes, correct? So we're gonna blaze through this. 
Um, so in my work on constructive approaches and responses to conflict, the very first fundamental basic Captain Obvious philosophy of conflict transformation is that conflict is natural. And not only is conflict natural, if you are in a community that cultivates and welcomes and uh, um, attracts difference, you are, if you are in an inclusive community, um, I, I prefer the language of inclusivity and I've shifted away from open and affirming. Um, because it doesn't go quite far enough to the welcoming piece and the belonging, right? I just feel like I'm still at the door. So if you're truly an inclusive community, um, it means that there will be conflict. I'll say that again. The more inclusive, the more communities of difference feel like they want to belong or that they do belong in your community, the more conflict you will have. But conflict is natural. And not just natural, it should be expected where difference thrives. If you have a large or a growing or a vital youth community, expect a lot of conflict. Because it means that there's difference there. That the young people feel comfortable enough to show up, to shake up some stuff. But conflict does not have to devolve into violence. Conflict is ambivalent. It just is. How we respond to conflict is the key. Because we tend to respond to conflict in ways that are, um, actually, let me pause and do this. I learned English when I was nine years old. Um, in Washington, D.C. And so I can remember very, very clearly what it feels like to communicate and to not be understood. And I remember very clearly what it was like to learn English. The other languages, I learned them you know, growing up. I don't remember learning them. Um, and so one of the reference points that I, I like to use to kind of guide myself when I'm learning something new is how would you have explained this to nine-year-old Jojo? So my question to you is how would you have defined conflict to nine-year-old Jojo? Yes. Somebody does not, or two parties have different needs, and they're pushing up against each other. Somebody's not getting their needs. Exactly. I love that. Tell me your name. Brittany. Brittany. Two uh, groups have different needs, and they're pushing up against each other. Yes. Yes. Someone else. I not give you all my definition. You just ignore it. <laughs> How else would you define conflict? Someone I haven't heard from today. I hate it when people say that, <laughs> but I just did. How would you define conflict to nine-year-old Jojo learning English? Yes. When an issue arises and the other person's not able to see where the other person's coming from. When an issue arises and one person is not able to see where the other person's coming from. Yes, tell me your name. Emily. Emily, yes. What I have done by showing you my definition is robbed you of the ability to name conflict as negative. But if you do this with your groups and ask them to define it for a nine-year-old without showing them the definition, you'll hear you know, when people are angry at each other or when something bad happens. We have all of these semantic layers of meaning that we associate with conflict that actually, etymologically, do not originate from conflict. Conflict just means striking together. Competing needs, and even competition in English has a negative connotation. You know, nobody in the church wants to be called competitive. Because think about all of the emotional and social uh, associations you start making with, you know, competitive. Oh, we have a competitive pastor. Nobody wants that. Uh-uh, <laughs> right? So priorities, how do we even speak of something that is ambivalent without layering onto it negativity? Um, but conflict is just that. Tectonic plates, if you think about it, right? Although the outcome of tectonic plates rubbing up against each other are tremors that could cause destruction where there are buildings erected, 
The act of the tectonic plates rubbing up against each other is actually quite an ambivalent act. There's no intention of destruction within those tectonic plates. The earth is shifting and moving and creating space for itself in order to grow new land masses. The outcome is just kind of negative for us if it happens underneath our cities, right? Conflict is striking together. The one thing that I want to leave with you here is that conflict and violence are absolutely distinct phenomena. You can, you can have violence, and that violence not be the reason, or that violence not be caused by a pre-existing conflict. Example, abusive relationships. There's no conflict there. Don't hit that person. There's no conflict. Another example, I might not get invited back for this. I'll pick, pick any one of the black folk murdered by police. Oh, you, daddy. Don't pick your daddy. <laughs> oh, you get to pick something else later, okay? But there's no conflict preceding those shootings. Don't agree? Think about how many non-people of color are successfully arrested while brandishing weapons. Okay? There's violence there. But see, our mind, because we see violence, we try to think about the conflict. Well, should they have been there? Wrong place, wrong time. Well, you shouldn't eat Skittles and walk. Well, why are you jogging down the street? Well, why are you sitting in your car with your wife and kids? So if we're able to step back and say conflict shows us where change needs to happen, where growth should happen, then maybe our response to violence will also be different. This is going to feel really unfair. We could talk about this first semester, I teach a semester long course on diversity, community, and conflict. And I've done this slide in like six minutes and that is so unfair, but you gotta move on. So I'm gonna breeze through this really, really quickly. How do we construct something new? How do we build? We've talked about what we need to deconstruct. I propose three things. First, improvise. Go ahead and pee, you know, just pee. Do what you gotta do right now. Follow, I know, my daughter's like, I heard that. Please don't do that right now. <laughs> there's, a there's a bathroom. Uh, um, don't wait for permission. Improvise. And then innovate. Do something different. You know, we, we pursue new so much that we forget that innovation is just doing something different. Do something different. Do it differently than you've been doing it before. And then iterate, do it again and again. Let's not stop in 2022 the innovation and improvisation that helped young people survive in 2020 and 2021. Don't stop caring about the mental health now that you're face to face. Don't stop asking about their home life now that you're face to face. Don't stop fighting for them to not clean because you're in person. A couple of thoughts to think around each one. Um, can someone read this Ashil Bembe quote for me, please? I've talked a lot. In yes, order. please. Uh, with the great top. Is it great top? Is White mask, yes, please. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, in order to sustain itself, power must be capable of breaking a fundamental law. Whether it is the law of the family or the law of all that has to do with death and profanation, including the disposal of human lives, even the lives of kin. Mm, thank you. So Ashil Bembe, political historian, <coughs> Africanist, writes about power and improvising what a political subject looks like and is. 
Um, Ashil Bembe is originally from Cameroon and so writes a lot about what it means to be black in decolonial context. How does it mean, what does it look like to decolonize what our states and sovereignty looks like and for black people, African descendant and in the diaspora to show up. Um, and he talks about the importance of identifying power for what it is. You know somebody's powerful when they can break a law and nothing is done to them. There's no consequence. That's how you know that somebody's powerful. And it's such a meaningful definition for me because it's so easy to grasp, right? If you think back to the Luba proverb, you're drenched in the rain, go ahead and pee. At that moment, you were owning your agency and breaking social norms. I'm going to pee right now. So that means that you do have a modicum of power. You do have the ability to do something different. So do it. Leave this Bambi quote with you. All right, on innovating. Wisdom from Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Um, trivia, <laughs> I have no prizes for you. Um, <laughs> Does anybody know what Dr. Well, the many amazing things that Dr. Crenshaw has done, does anybody know what Dr. Crenshaw is most recognized for? <laughs> Love it. Can someone read this quote? There was someone who wanted to read earlier, I think, my brother with the hoodie? Yes. Uh, treating different things the same can generate as much an inequality as treating the same things differently. That sit with you for a moment. Yeah. I don't think I need to add to Dr. Crenshaw's wisdom. And last but not least, iterate. How many of you have read Cast? Yeah. If you have not, it is uh it, it looks huge and, and and intimidating. But Isabel Wilkerson is an incredible storyteller. And before you know it, you'll just be getting through those pages really rapidly. Um, can someone read this quote from Isabel Wilkerson, please? Yes, please. The owner of an old house knows that whatever you are ignoring will never go away. Whatever is lurking will fester, whether you choose to look or not. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction. Whatever you are wishing away will gnaw at you until you gather the courage to face what you would rather not see. Mm. Thank you. Wilkerson, um, for those who've read it, you're familiar with this. Wilkerson's metaphor for the caste system, which is a system of social hierarchy and a structure that um, is um, informed by and informs racism. Um, she uses the metaphor of an old house. Because uh, often we, especially those of us who are still alive and breathing today, um, we like to say, well, I wasn't there during slavery, you know, on the continent. Well, I didn't sell my brothers and sisters into slavery. We like to claim deniability. And I love what Wilkerson says. Wilkerson says, hey, we all inherited this old house. We didn't build it. But we inherited it. And we're living in it. So you ignoring the problem with the house will not make the problems go away, period. And I think it's brilliant. We have inherited a new way, or we've inherited an awareness that the way that we've done youth ministry is broken. But ignoring that and plowing forward anyway is not going to make the challenges go away. How many of us have wished, don't raise your hand. How many of us have been like, man, I'm tired. I'm tired of these you know, vaccinations. I'm tired, everybody got COVID anyway. I'm tired of being careful. I just wanna hug everybody. I just wanna kiss everybody. I'm just, I wish all of this would just go away. Don't raise your hand, right? But ignoring the issues that have been put in our face as a result of this global pandemic will not make those issues go away. And that's much more magnified for our young people. So I'm going to ignore that. And we're going to stop here because our time is up. So my question to you all, you are here. 
We had the privilege to be here in person. Some of our folks at home are streaming. They're here virtually, have the electricity and internet to be here. You are here. So what's next? What will you do? Thank you.